This is a story that should have a happy ending. A commodity boom, shareholders with a history in the liberation struggle and extremely wealthy, if controversial, foreign investors. Now, Mac, manganese is a metal much in demand and it's in plentiful supply in the Northern Cape. In a perfect world, a share of the profits generated by the mining and selling of manganese would be given to surrounding communities. And that, in theory, was the intention behind the Kuruman Community Trust. But in a two-part investigation, we show that theory and practice are often very different, especially when billions of rands are involved. Here's Masa. Imagine being told you've been chosen as a beneficiary of a manganese mine. You and 20 other people in your village are now part of a trust. Your lives will change. You will be lifted out of poverty. And when the mine opens, you'll be employed. You even get bussed all the way to Pretoria to meet the Deputy Minister of Mineral Resources. Eighteen years later, the mine is flourishing, but you are still unemployed and struggling to survive. Poverty has settled on the Moncho family like a second skin. We met Didimalo going to fetch water, but the only tap in the village was dry. It makes it harder to take care of her sick father, who was frail and confined to bed. <laughs> That means The Northern Cape has rampant unemployment, few opportunities and a growing alcohol and drug problem. But beneath this red soil lies 80% of the world's manganese. It's a booming industry. So why is this community still poor? When mining rights were nationalized in 2004, it presented huge opportunities for black empowerment. Stefan Sprumer was a journalist for the Mail and Guardian at the time. The Department of Minerals said it's going to give these rights only to BEE companies. And then a technical and financial partners would be brought in after the fact of the award of the mining rights. Enter billionaire Russian oligarch Viktor Vexelberg, owner of the Renova Group, a conglomerate with interests in telecoms, energy, and yes, mining. Vexelberg is a typical Russian oligarch. The oligarchs are politically influential businessmen who made their fortunes when state-run industries were privatized after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Vexelberg made his money out of oil fields and especially bauxite mining. In 2004, Vexelberg was worth $10 billion. He splashed out on nine priceless Fabergé eggs, which are housed in his private museum in St. Petersburg. He also visited South Africa for the first time on the lookout for mining investment opportunities. He met, amongst others, um, the mining minister, um, Pumzile Mlambungulka at the time, and Thabo Mbeki, the president at the time. So he had access to some powerful people. Clearly, he had some diplomatic backing also from the Russian side. And I think so he was able to make a grand entrance. Vexelberg's attention was directed to the Northern Cape manganese fields by an investment arm of the ANC, Chancellor House named after the building in downtown Joburg that originally housed the law firm of Mandela and Tambo. Chancellor House was set up around 2003. It was set up simply to fund the ANC. And I think there were a number of meetings between Renova and, and ANC officials. He also met Lazarus Mbete, a politically connected businessman from Bumalanga involved in coal mining, security and farming. Mbete's company Pizaya Sechaba, meaning community pot, applied for the mining rights. But these could only be awarded if the local Gurman community was included in the venture. People of 
Nkrumah were exploited. Nelson Handisi is the chairperson of the John Daule Haitsewe Civic Organization. Mbete, he pushed to open the mine to say, uh, you are the local people, you are the beneficiary or you are the shareholder, come, 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 come. Uh, I'm opening the mine, help me to get the license. The Kuruman Community Trust was founded by Mbete in 2005. He selected 20 people from 27 villages around the Kuruman area, a total of 540 beneficiaries. He bused representatives from each village to the DMR in Pretoria. <laughs> Motlale Pula Mosetlo was one of the beneficiaries on the bus. With promises of employment, education, roads and clinics, Doreen Jeyakai felt they were on the road to the promised land. <laughs> And so it came to pass that United Manganese of Kalahari opened in 2005 with Lazarus Mbete as chairman of a joint venture between Renova and BEE partner Majestic Silver Trading 40, a consortium with strong political links. Majestic Silver Trading is made up of Chancellor House and Bizaya Sechaba, with Guruman Community Trust getting 8% of the shares. Mexelberg's relationship with the ANC getting into bed with Chancellor House, for example, I don't think it is necessarily because he believes in, in, in what the ANC stands for. It was simply he is sucking up to power. That's what oligarchs do. The Brenthurst Foundation's Ray Hartley agrees. There are people within the ANC who admire the Russian oligarchic system, where you have a political elite and a bunch of elite businesses around that, making a lot of money out of that elite and contracts being shared amongst friends and all that kind of thing, which is the way Russia works. In 2006, Russian President Vladimir Putin came to South Africa on a state visit, accompanied by a large business delegation. Leading that delegation was none other than Viktor Vexelberg, with promises of investment in infrastructure. And money talks. The license was granted and UMK started mining in 2008. Five years later, they celebrated their joint venture. I believe our mine is a real Northern Cape success story. Indeed, a South African success story. UMK mine is the most positive example of uh, cooperation between Russia and South Africa. Cooperation witnessed by Presidents Putin and Zuma when Viktor Vexelberg and Lazarus Mbete signed agreements in Durban. This is the mine that has been raining riches on its Russian and South African shareholders, 2.4 billion rand a year. But while its partners have been divvying up the dosh, it seems the local community that was used to unlock that wealth has been left out in the cold. The people were used. The man, uh, Mr. Mbete, played his cards well. Dineo Lewis worked as an admin officer for the Kuruman Community Trust. I was so discouraged because really what was promised was, was not happening. Khodisangi Tumeleng is one of the village leaders. So Instead of gold and silver, the beneficiaries get a food parcel in December. The groceries, they are not even edible because some of them, they are expired. Some of them, they are very small. Nuku Matilo is a community activist who the beneficiaries approached for help. You can imagine waiting for the whole year for 5 kg. 
KCT told Carte Blanche they distribute over 54,000 food parcels every year, but the beneficiaries say they are mostly from the mine, not the trust. This is what the trust gave to the beneficiaries in the Christmas hamper last year. Some flour, tinned fish, uh, jam, coffee creamer, rice, some brown sugar, packed soup and um, maize meal. All for a grand total of about 1,200 rand. I mean, it's like they're saying, Ach, let them eat pap. Not that Mbete and his colleagues weren't generous with their advice. Why not start companies to service the mine? Like a laundry business, for example. So each village had to open a company under a cooperative called Kuruman Community Mining and Other Projects. KCMO has contracts with the mine. So in a very useful arrangement for some, the mine continued paying dividends into the trust, while the beneficiaries get a mere thousand rand a year from KCMO, their own company. Rather than sharing in the windfall, the beneficiaries are in effect paying themselves. Are you saying when I'm getting a thousand rand a year, I am benefiting? That's not a benefiting, it's a shame. And on that thousand rand, years goes by, things change, there's inflation, there's whatever, but the thousand rand does not change. But the shame doesn't end there. Coming up, we continue our investigation and find promises of prosperity broken by the politically connected and a community that's had enough. We're in the Northern Cape Manganese fields where the new black gold is making a mine called UMK and its shareholders fabulously wealthy. A Russian conglomerate and the ANC's Chancellor House, but a community trust meant to benefit over 500 of the poorest of the poor is big on promises, short on delivery, and the beneficiaries want answers. <laughs> Among the mine's Russian investors is a company run by this man, Viktor Vexelberg, a multi-billionaire squeezed by international sanctions, but warmly welcomed on our shores. The Guruman Community Trust is an indirect shareholder in the mine, but beneficiaries say they only get a thousand rand a year and a food parcel. And the money doesn't even come from the trust, but from the cooperative owned by the beneficiaries themselves. So what can you do with a thousand rand a year? That's 83 rand a month. 83 rand. That's about a loaf of bread a week. And to get that pittance, they have to spend money. Molly Mabe lives in Khadiboye with her disabled son. It's an hour to Kurman by taxi. When the mine started working, all of a sudden there were changes. As an admin officer for the trust, Dineo Lewis had an inside view. She says most agreements were verbal and the trust's founder, Lazarus Mbete, claimed he never promised anyone shares. So he just went against his word. And, and, and we started to hear that the trust belongs to him. Lazarus Mbete is also a director of UMK, as well as Majestic Silver Trading 40 and Bizaya Sachaba, both shareholders in the mine. In the 10 years and four months that you worked for the trust, did you ever get to see the financials? No. In fact, we didn't find a single beneficiary who'd seen the trust's books. So just how much money has it received from the mine? Based on the financial statements of Renova Manganese Investments in the last 10 years, UMK declared and paid dividends of over $486 million to its shareholders. As a shareholder of Majestic Silver Trading, the beneficiaries of the Kuruman Community Trust should have received almost $20 million, well over 300 million rand. So where has that money gone? <laughs> Monica Letwanya is a beneficiary demanding her share. 
But while the beneficiaries dwell in deprivation, the Russian shareholders face first world problems. In 2018, the Renova Group and Victor Vexelberg were sanctioned by the United States. Renova responded by changing its name to New African Manganese Investments, registered in Cyprus. Vexelberg responded by putting his house in a plush American suburb on the market. But after Russia invaded Ukraine last year, the news tightened around Vexelberg and his oligarchs. Today, at the request of the United States Department of Justice, Spanish authorities seized a super yacht belonging to a sanctioned Russian oligarch. Not only did Vexelberg lose his yacht, but also his jet, his house he tried to sell, and his luxury apartment in Manhattan valued at $11 million. His bank accounts holding $1.5 billion were also frozen. They are living large. They are getting, you can, you can imagine the Russian who is sitting in Russia with the yards and all those uh, luxury. Whereas the people that went into a toy to say we want this mining right, they are living in shame. So what is it about Russia and its controversial business moguls that appears so enticing to the ANC? Is it the party's historical ties to Moscow, especially during the liberation struggle? Something no better demonstrated than our government's refusal to condemn Russia's war in Ukraine. It's true, Russia did support uh, the ANC in exile, did support the struggle against apartheid. But it, it's more nuanced than that. I mean, the, the first groupings of ANC exiles that went for training in Russia were trained in Ukraine at Odessa and other places in Ukraine. You know, it's a bit simplistic to sort of now historically associate Russia and not Ukraine with that history. Whatever the reason, it's a relationship that's bearing fruit for some. In the minutes of a 2007 meeting of the KCT, struggle veteran and trustee Major General Jackie Sidibe couldn't have been clearer about who exactly was benefiting. It is for the first time the ANC as a party is given the opportunity to own a mining business, not an individual or a company, the party. Some of the beneficiaries we spoke to were too scared to talk to us on camera saying, this is an ANC mine. That perception is well-founded. And while the 540 beneficiaries may not be benefiting much from this mine, the ruling party certainly is. Between UMK, Majestic Silver and Chancellor House, at least 55 million rands went to the ANC over these two years. Even last year's ANC elective conference was part funded by UMK to the to tune of 15 million rand. We requested an interview from Lazarus Mbeta to find out how much money is in the trust and where it's going. His PR company wrote back to say that Mr Mbeta would not be available to participate in an interview. Instead, they told us about their flagship project, the state-of-the-art mobile medical centre that services the Gurman community. But mobile is an overstatement. Here it is on the grounds of an existing clinic in Khamobid. How do you expect a mobile clinic to go and stand in Charahano Community Hospital, whereas the, the, the 27 villages don't have clinics? So this clinic, if indeed it was for the community, it would be in the outskirts, rurals, saving the real beneficiaries of the trust. Before leaving Gurman, we visited another of KCT's much vaunted projects, the sinking of a borehole in each of the 27 villages. But the boreholes are being sunk in the yards of the village leaders, like Leti Dibakwe in Manyadin. The borehole project was announced by trustee George Fanambi. We called him to ask a few questions about the trust. Dumela. Dumela, you're speaking to Masa Kekana from Cote Blanche. Mr. Fanambi, we'd like to arrange an interview with you. We can come to your offices perhaps tomorrow. You are, you are calling me from? Cote Blanche. Cote Blanche? Yes, the television where program. Get, where, did you, where did you get this number from? We got the number from our sources. We'd like to talk to you about the Gurman no, Community you, Trust, you Mr. Fanambi. Mr. Fanambi? Go to your, go to your sources. 
tired of being stonewalled, the beneficiaries have now lawyered up and are represented by Louise Duplessis from Lawyers for Human Rights. Should these beneficiaries have had access to those financials? Of course they must have. They are the beneficiaries. So they will have to give us that financial statements, trust deed, any other documents, shareholder agreements, any other agreements that the trust enter into on behalf of the beneficiaries. UMK declined an interview, saying they have no legal authority over the affairs of the Gurman Community Trust. Repeated requests for comment from Chancellor House, Majestic Silver Trading, the ANC and the DMR were ignored. We were, it seems, getting a taste of what the beneficiaries have been through for close to two decades. Thanks so much for watching. And we love sharing these unique and eye-opening stories with you. By the way, if you have friends and family living overseas, they can also join in on the Carte Blanche conversation. Tell them to find Carte Blanche, the podcast, now on all major podcast platforms.